Neurological adventure continues through the non-metal native elements. We've only talked about one so far, and that's diamond. And today we're going to pick it up with graphite. So big B will be graphite. The chemical formula of graphite is simple. It is just carbon. In the textbook, this is page 350. Let me insert a picture of graphite. It's a mineral that you're all familiar with. Some of you are using it probably right now because famously the lead in your pencil is a mixture of clay plus graphite which smears across the page with beautiful penmanship I'm sure. It's had many other uses as well both modern and ancient. Uh, crucibles are one very important use of graphite. Cannonballs that were used by like the British Empire in the past were made in graphite crucibles. And today the Nissan Leaf uses graphite in its batteries. In fact, it uses about 40 kilograms of graphite in order to have that electric car. So there's a lot of different uses of graphite. It's controlled by its chemistry. And the important thing about the chemistry is going to end up being its bonding. And it's different than diamonds, which was covalently bonded. But these are covalently bonded as well, just slightly differently. And what ends up happening is that the covalent bonds of carbon, right? So each one of these black dots is a carbon, and each one of these right here is a covalent bond. It forms these rings of six covalently bonded carbons to one another. And those rings get bonded into sheets. So these sheets of covalently bonded carbon are very loosely held together by van der Waals bonds. So what we want to picture here is so here's one ring, right? And we have to make that ring into a sheet. So we could have like another ring set up right here and it's all interconnected into a nice framework, right? So there's one ring and we can do another ring here. Right? And so we make these beautiful sheets. But the sheets themselves are held together. So here's one sheet. There could be another sheet down here by van der Waals bonds. So let's, we're drawing this in. There's our another ring, and you can imagine it extending out. And between these, there are these really weak bonds that sort of hold the structure together. But they just don't hold it together very well. So these are the van der Waals bonds. Um, and we'll write that up here. So sheets of covalently bonded carbon loosely held together by widely spaced van der Waals bonds. Loosely held together by widely spaced Van der Waals bonds. That's the chemical significance that has so many mineralogical effects. So um, as we go into mineralogy, let's talk about the effects of these weak bonds. Well, one is going to be that graphite has a perfect basal cleavage. And the reason for that perfect basal cleavage is it's very easy to shatter graphite in between those van der Waals bonds. It also gives it the, the feeling. When you pick up graphite, it's really easy to, to identify it just based on touch because it has a greasy feel because these sheets pull apart and they can like even stain your fingers. So we call that soil fingers. It gives it, of course, it also has a very low uh, hardness and specific gravity because it's not very densely packed because of these van der Waals bonds. In the end, it's a very easy mineral to identify because of that feel and its lightness. And you can only really confuse it with a mineral called molybdenite, which I'll introduce to you in a few weeks. So uh, the occurrence geologically, well, it is a hexagonal mineral, but we don't see it as a hexagonal. Crystals, instead what we see is we see it occurring, occurs as scaly masses. Okay, we see it occurring as scaly masses. So if we were, this is our scaly mass. If we were to zoom in and look at it at a more um, magnified, microscopic way, this is what we would start to see. We see all these tiny little perfectly cleaved uh, fragments that are all just held together in a single mass.
So that's our mineralogy. Now let's just get into a little bit of geologic occurrence. There's a lot of different ways that graphite can occur, but most of them are like nuanced, they're not very common, and so there's only one that we need to talk about, and that is the metamorphism of carbon-rich sedimentary rocks. Metamorphism of, we need carbon, right? And the carbon source here is biologic. It's little critters and organisms that die and then get included in the sedimentary rock record. So metamorphism of carbon-rich sedimentary rocks. All right, you should imagine a shale with a lot of organic carbon in it. That shale gets metamorphosed into a schist and uh, the carbon gets turned into graphite. Maybe let's say that. Let's say shale will go to a schist where the shale has organic carbon from the dying of organisms and the schist there for, then has graphite. You can even metamorphose coal, for example. And when you get a, a metamorphic rock with graphite in it, it might look something like this. It tends to be black and dark from the graphite and it might even uh, rub off on your hands a bit. So, that's it for graphite. Let's move on to the next mineral for today, and that's going to be sulfur. So this is big C. This is sulfur. Chemical formula is S. Now I want to say something. F versus pH. You can spell sulfur with an F, and that's how the way the textbook does it. That's the way I see it the most in the scientific literature. But if you're driving around Texas or Great Britain or wherever you end up being, oh boy, I right, zoomed out. Zoom back in. You'll see it spelled with a pH, and that tends to be the non-scientific way to spell it. I'm not going to count it wrong either way, but just know that I try to spell it this way, and I'm not spelling it wrong. In the textbook, uh, sulfur is talked about on pages 345 to 346. And here's what I want you to know about sulfur. It is super easy to identify because it has this bright canary yellow color, whether it occurs in crystalline bunches or as massive deposits. And it always has a really unique smell. It will be probably the easiest mineral for you to identify. Its mineralogical properties are controlled a lot by its chemistry. And there's similarities to graphite here because there are rings of covalently bonded sulfur that are held together by loose van der Waals bonds, right? That sounds familiar. The rings here are a little more uh, irregular. They almost look like crowns. I don't know if we can draw that. Can we draw that? Nope. Nope, that got really bad. But anyways, it's supposed to be kind of be this like kind of jaggedy ring type structure. And then each of these rings are bonded to more rings. Uh, so let's just say it instead of draw it like a four-year-old rings of eight, rings of eight covalently bonded sulfur held together so when I say held together it means one ring is held together with another ring and since those rings are held together by Vanderbilt ball Vanderbilt's bonds it's very weak and sulfur should have a low density and a low hardness and that's all true so held together by weak Van der Waals bonds. As a result of the weak Van der Waals bonds, we have some important mineralogy phenomenon. One is that the hardness is basically two. The specific gravity is about 2.1, which is very light, and this is very soft. Another phenomenon is that it will melt really easily because those van der Waals bonds break down with um, just a little increase of temperature. It melts at about 119 degrees Celsius, just a little bit hotter than boiling water. So it's very easy to have liquid sulfur existing in the subsurface, for example. Other mineralogical things to discuss is that we get this bright canary yellow color that is just flat out diagnostic and as long as well as its uh, sulfur smell. And then I guess the last thing I would want to say under its mineralogy is that it can crystallize with beautiful orthorhombic crystals, right? 2 over m, 2 over m, 2 over m. 
but that is rare. Instead, what we see is this right here, which are massive, all right, so massive deposits. And by, de by massive, what do I mean? I mean, fine grain, just equal granular kind of thing are common. In massive and in broken crystals, we should see fracture. So it doesn't have a cleavage, instead it has conchoidal fracture, or just we can think of it as irregular fracture. So that is our mineralogy. And then now just to finish this off, I want to go through the geologic occurrence. And there's three different geologic occurrences. I can't eliminate any of them because all three are important for your understanding of sulfur. Geologic occurrences. And the reason why it, these geologic occurrences matter is because sulfur is incredibly important economically. It is the most, so besides like oil and natural gas, which are organic fluids, sulfur ends up being the most important inorganic liquid because it is used for, and we can just put this off to the side, it's used in H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, which is so important in industry. It's also used in fertilizer. So there's a big market for sulfur on the, on the world economy. So there are three different occurrences. Uh, should we start with pictures? Yeah, we should always start with pictures. So our geologic occurrences are volcanic, where sulfur is a really important gas in a magma, and so when it, it can degas to the side of a volcano and encrust the landscape with vapor deposited sulfur crystals, which is what you're seeing in this picture. And then you can also get it as a byproduct, or um, I guess we say this, in coal deposits, you can have like around 1% is occurring in coal. We see the little bands of yellow in this coal, or you can get it in big thick sequences in the sedimentary record. Here's like an outcrop of just straight up sulfur in the sedimentary rock sequence in Texas. So those are our geologic occurrences that we're going to get into right now. So number one, with this picture right above us, we have sulfur is a common gas in magmas and will precipitate at fumaroles. Precipitate at fumaroles. A fumarole is a, is a volcanic vent. All right, so we can just think about that as a vent. This is not the most important location in terms of economy, but it is something that occurs globally because there's volcanoes around the world and all of them are producing sulfur. The second most important, or not important, but in our list is, is occurs as impurities in coal. This is part of the coal forming process from organic material. And the reason why this matters is because we burn lots of coal. And so we think about sulfur as this pollutant. When we burn a coal burning power plant, it can release sulfur to the atmosphere. And that's one of the important gases that is not good for our uh, climate. Our third record, this one's probably the most impressive because you get these deposits that are hundreds of feet thick sometimes. And it's a fairly complicated chemical reaction where you take a sulfate, and so a sulfate reacts to sulfur. And what a sulfate is, is, is something with an SO4 to minus in the chemical formula. And this process that turns it into sulfur, all right, this is just the same thing twice, um, you have to have, this is just, this means reaction. And so the question is, what is the source of sulfate and what is the thing that drives the reaction? Well, the sulfate is a mineral like gypsum. So gypsum is a mineral we haven't talked about yet, but it has a chemical formula of caso 42 h 20 o and it is incredibly common in sedimentary rocks. Gypsum is common, let's say that, is common in sed rocks. Shorthand for sedimentary rocks. And that SO4 will get broken down um, into pure sulfur. And it breaks down. The thing that drives the chemical reaction is twofold. It can either be anaerobic bacteria, so actually a life process, 
or it can be reactions with hydrocarbons like natural gas and oil that cause a chemical reaction with this to liberate and free up the sulfur. So let's say that it is um, common said rocks breaks down by anaerobic anaerobic bacteria or by reactions with hydrocarbons. To produce, uh, to produce huge sulfur deposits. This was the main economic source for many, many years, and is still in some places in the in the world, not in the United States. Around the year two thousand, because of different like um, climate change type environmental regulations, and because. Exxon and Marathon and these different petroleum producers realize they can make money this way, right? Because money drives everything in this world. Um, the actual economic source, so this is not a four, this is just kind of like a little asterisk star, that the economic source today is by capture, how do we say this, as a byproduct of petroleum industry. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture. I happen to be recording this in Texas, and so we see like a um, petroleum processing factories all over the place and those factories now you can kind of picture like this kind of thing right here as one of their byproducts as they make the hydrocarbons the oil and natural gas more pure they extract sulfur and not a small amount look at how much I mean these are tons and tons of sulfur gets extracted and that's the number one way the United States produces it today it's good economically and it's much better for the environment so it's a good thing so today's economic source is byproduct of petroleum industry. And I think with that, we're done today.